so much for coming to our presentation on insomnia. My name is Eve. I'm JB. And I'm Dave. So today, <laughs> okay. Um, today's game plan, we're going to start off by filling out an optional questionnaire. Um, so this is to sort of mimic a questionnaire that you might fill out if you were trying to get diagnosed for insomnia yourself. Just so you know, we will anonymously put, be putting the results of the questionnaire up here at the end of the presentation. So if you feel uncomfortable answering any of the questions, like do not feel like you have to answer all of them. They're all optional within the form. So just whatever you want to, feel free to fill out. Um, after that, we will define insomnia for you all and then go on to talk about different types of insomnia. So I'll be discussing acute insomnia. Um, Gabe will be discussing chronic insomnia. And JB will talk about comorbid insomnia. And we will also define those for you. So don't worry, it's a lot of vocab words. Uh, then we're going to share the results of the questionnaire point out some problem areas that I'm sure will exist, and uh, then talk about treatment, how uh, people normally get diagnosed, and how they go about trying to uh, lessen their insomnia they experience. So, a brief acute introduction. Uh, insomnia does affect more than 60 million Americans, and it just proportionately affects women and people over the age of 65, and we'll talk a little bit more about why that is in just a minute, um, but there are the several types that I mentioned that we will discuss today. And a brief trigger warning, just so you know, we do make brief reference to trauma and its effects on sleep, although we don't get into any detail, we just sort of touch on it and move on. Um, there is a discussion of mental disorders and anxiety and depression and how it relates to your ability to get a good night's sleep, and there are references to drugs medicated or otherwise, and alcohol. Um, so if you feel uncomfortable at any point, feel free to go, but we don't get too in-depth about any of those things, just so you know. Great, so what we're gonna do right now is we're gonna fill out the questionnaire. If you all can open up some sort of electronic device, um, I'm- Is it a Stanford EDU questionnaire? Yes, it's a Stanford EDU questionnaire. So, um, so it is on the Facebook event, um, it has just been posted. It is taken from a form, a questionnaire created by the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. And the purpose of the questionnaire is so that you all can see what it is like to fill out a questionnaire on insomnia, the types of questions that are being asked, so that you can see what exactly it is that might constitute someone who has insomnia. We have, as stated, made every single question optional, so that you all do not need to fill out any question you do not feel comfortable answering. All of the responses will be anonymous, um, so we will not know who's filled out anything. And when we post any sort of responses of any kind, it will all be in an aggregate form. So there will be no determination of one answer connecting to another answer, or any fear of any sort of personal information being released. Um, so if you all want to take a couple of minutes to fill out this questionnaire, now is the time to do so. And uh, once we're able to collect the results, uh, later in the presentation, we'll be providing a uh, quick analysis of the results we find, point out any trends that might exist within the group as it's collected here. And you know, just another note, this, this is an actual uh, questionnaire administered by medical professionals. Uh, if you like, we can forward out the, uh, the study that it's referenced in for anybody who wants to look into it more. And for the question about Stanford emails, I just changed the privacy settings on the questionnaire so that they now do not need to be filled out by someone with a Stanford email address.
Yeah, uh, once we get a sense that most people have had the chance to fill it out, we will get rid of that. We don't need to go too much into depth. It's awesome. But we appreciate it if you do. <laughs> So uh, now that most people have filled out the questionnaire, uh, thank you again for taking the time to do that. Uh, we'll be going over results later in the presentation. Just to kick things off in terms of uh, what insomnia is, uh, essentially what makes insomnia pretty uh, unique in terms of uh, sleep disorders is that it is, essentially it's a psychosomatic disorder. The incidence of it and the severity of the disorder is impacted by uh, cognitive processes uh, within each individual patient. No case of insomnia is going to be identical to another one, just how the disorder will manifest itself within each individual. Obviously, there are categories that we'll be going over, but the incidence within each person will be affected by their own personality, their pre genetic predisposition for it, as well as any uh, environmental factors that they might be encountering. And uh, what happens with insomnia is that uh, it needs to involve a noticeable uh, dissatisfaction with any amount of sleep that actually does end up occurring. So for instance, uh, just one night of bad sleep does not in of itself constitute insomnia. It needs to be essentially a pattern of behavior where this anxiety is built up about the act of sleeping. And that can cause a gradual erosion of sleep quality over time and the inability to actually fall asleep when the opportunity presents itself. So uh, that could mean, you know, you have a warm blanket, a cold pillow, you're getting ready for bed. But as you actually lie down, thoughts start racing through your mind about the stresses of the day or about things in the future. Or you start to try and pinpoint that exact sensation of falling asleep. I've tried that before. I don't know if anyone here has actually been able to nail it down, but just thinking about that can actually be a trigger for an insomniac episode uh, because your body will try and adjust for uh, the stress that it induces and won't be able to fall asleep. So some of the symptoms that are listed here, it can manifest itself in any number of ways, anxiety, uh, fatigue, uh, excessive sleepiness in the day, uh, that's why it's so important, as we'll get going in the rest of the presentation, about it's very important to really isolate exactly what the disorder is because the symptoms overlap with a lot of different uh, potential disorders. So it's important to really diagnose it properly. Um, so some things that heighten the risk of insomnia include stress. So unfortunately, probably a lot of people in this room have a heightened risk of insomnia. Um, also, if you have experienced something traumatic uh, in the recent past, for instance, divorce, death of a loved one, that might also trigger insomnia. Working at night or frequent major shifts in work hours. Uh, so for instance, people that are doctors and work exchange hours or perhaps do the night shift often experience insomnia because their body's trying to adjust and it's just unable to do so. If you travel long distances with time changes, so a lot of business people experience insomnia and jet lag and a host of other problems because uh, they travel so much. Um, certain medical conditions or sleep conditions, for instance, if you have sleep apnea where basically your brain is not able to like sleep and breathe at the same time, so you're getting very shallow sleep, um, that also is a type of insomnia and can lead to, or can lead to insomnia, I should say. Um, if you have an inactive lifestyle, that might contribute as well. But we'll talk. <laughs> this is lots of faces. Um, I'll talk a little bit later about things you can do within your daily life to sort of <clears throat> lower the risk of insomnia. So there are, as we mentioned, three main types of insomnia we'll be talking about today. The one I will be speaking about is acute insomnia. The definition of acute insomnia is any type of insomnia um, that lasts less than three months, and it's often related to an identifiable cause. Um, and it is the most common of all of the short-term types of insomnia. So some symptoms, there's a whole bunch here, but basically uh, if you 
aren't able to fall asleep, you feel drowsy during the day, you can't concentrate, um, if you experience mood changes, or you experience a lot of social errors or physical errors throughout the day. Like a lot of night shift workers, um, when they are awake at night, will um, have a lot more errors than they would if they got a normal sleep schedule just because they are so exhausted physically, so it can be dangerous for that respect as well. Um, you can experience headaches or stomach pains or tension throughout your body. Um, some causes uh, include changes in the conditions of the sleep environment. So if you're suddenly sleeping in a place that gets a lot of sunlight before you would normally want to wake up, that might contribute to it. Uh, if you start a new medication or medication messes up your internal processes, um, if you drink a lot of caffeine or have nicotine, especially before bed and the few hours leading up to it, that can keep you up. Um, alcohol is a really interesting cause because like, you can get knocked out from alcohol, but it's the type of rest that's not actually restful. You're not, or like, you're not getting refreshed by this type of sleep. It's just extremely shallow. And you'll notice if you drink a lot of alcohol and you wake up the next morning, even if you got a lot of hours of sleep, you don't feel well rested. You feel awful. Um, and that is why. Um, you might also, uh, it might be because of pain that keeps you up, like physical pain in your body or stress, as we mentioned before. Um, and then finally, nighttime urination. That's why a lot of people over 65 might experience insomnia because they experience a lot more aches and pains and might have to pee a lot more. Or if they're like me, they just already have to pee a lot. So <laughs> <laughs> many different causes. Um, if you want to get a diagnosis for acute insomnia, and you don't require any special crazy testing, your healthcare provider can do it. Um, if it's longer than three months, that's not acute insomnia, so we're just talking about this specific type. Um, but some common questions you might get from the doctor include questions about ongoing new health problems, your sleep history and habits, family history, if anyone else in your family has ever experienced insomnia, um, your daily routine, recent stressful life events. So basically trying to pinpoint the underlying cause of this newfound insomnia. And then lifestyle questions like, are you an active person, inactive? Um, how much caffeine do you drink on a daily basis, stuff like that. So some things that you notice in your questionnaire as well. <clears throat> yep, so when it comes to uh, chronic insomnia, uh, the medical field is it usually placed the uh, boundary line between acute and chronic at about a month of incidence. Uh, some papers might have it as a free or more. Basically, uh, the working theory regarding chronic insomnia is that your body adapts a series of behaviors that create a sense state of uh, hypervigilance for the activity of sleep itself. So as we'll be going later in this presentation about how you actually treat these different symptoms, uh, what happens is that whenever you engage with uh, bed or, or anything related to sleep in that context, your body will have this uh, trained response essentially to in induce a lot of anxiety regarding the activity of sleep. So it, it, it can create this really nasty cycle where an insomniac will use the language like, I'll, I'll try to get eight hours of sleep, you know, or I, I must try to get at least that much every day. Or um, they'll talk about how everything, the outcomes of their day the next day are entirely dependent on if they're successful that night. So to them, uh, the analogy that I've seen is like, imagine if you had to tell a friend, well, I'll try to breathe, you know, like for, for the majority of the population, you know, of course, there are people who do suffer from debilitating illness. Uh, for the majority of the population, that would strike us as extremely odd. But for some reason, when it comes to sleep hygiene and sleep patterns, we don't really pinpoint that as much. So it's very important to be cognizant of how people use that language because it could be uh, indicative of chronic insomnia. And uh, as we mentioned in uh, the trigger warning, uh, of course, a lot of what can induce the chronic insomnia, it, it could be related to trauma that an individual has suffered. Uh, the very act of letting down one's guard while trying to sleep could reemerge an emotional episode, and it, it could really hamper an individual's ability to sleep. Uh, it also could be indicative of uh, other sleep disorders, uh, which is more of a domain of what's known as comorbid insomnia. <laughs> so what we've just discussed so far are two forms of insomnia called primary insomnia. When you have acute insomnia or chronic insomnia, 
they are generally classified as an independent individual thing. In the past, there was another form of insomnia called secondary insomnia. And this was insomnia that occurred when you had another kind of disorder accompanying your insomnia. Um, it was changed to comorbid insomnia because causality was sometimes very difficult to determine. Um, it can be caused by the other disorder itself, it can have caused the other disorder, or they could both be independent of each other. Um, this comorbid insomnia is then therefore more prevalent than the other two forms, just because if you have another disorder of any kind accompanying your insomnia, then it becomes the form of comorbid insomnia. And so there are then a large list of different types of comorbidity, as they're called. Um, so I'm going to go through a couple of them. Um, the most common form is psychiatric comorbidities. 40% um, of people with insomnia have psychiatric disorders of some kind. Um, I don't, my notes are not up. Sorry. Uh, that shows you all. That's great. <laughs> okay. Um, so certain psychiatric disorders are things along the lines of anxiety or depression. Um, they have basically the chance of either causing your insomnia itself or, again, being the cause of the insomnia. Um, and so they generally go and they create a sort of spiral effect as they're going on. Um, now another form is medical disorders. Um, these basically occur when a certain medical disorder that you might have causes an inability to sleep. Um, so some of the most common are congestive heart failure, um, chronic obstructive pulmonary, pulmonary disease, um, acid reflux of the kind of gastrointestinal reflux, um, prostatic hypertrophy, and diabetes. Um, basically, when you have a medical disorder accompanying your insomnia, you have to treat the disorder before you treat the insomnia because a lot of treatments for insomnia end up actually aggravating and making the disorder worse. Um, then you have medication. Um, there are a lot of medications that are prescribed that cause people to have more difficulty sleeping. Um, so antidepressants, anti-inflammatory hormones are some of the big ones. Um, steroids, also a very common form that cause people to have difficulty sleeping. Um, and then also when you have any sort of sedation, um, once you are taken off of that medicine, it likely leads to insomnia as you're then trying to work through getting over being forced to sleep by medication. Um, this is a long list. Um, there are many, again, it's basically any type of disorders. So neurological disorders, um, Parkinson's, Huntington's, progressive dystonia, and Tourette's and epilepsy um, are among very large causes of insomnia. Um, dementia can cause multiple awakenings during the night and daytime drowsiness. Um, and these then, when are accompanied by circadian rhythm abnormalities, which I'll go over in a second, which are basically caused when we as people, as humans, as living creatures, have circadian rhythms in which we like to be awake during the daytime and asleep during the nighttime. It is the way that our body is designed to be. And so what happens when we no longer have that awake during one time and sleeping during the other time and the hours change in any sort of way, it leads us to then not be able to fall asleep at the right time. Um, chronic pain, um, arthritis, osteoarthritis, um, headaches, muscular dystrophy, any sort of thing that is a pain within the body can lead you to then not be able to sleep well at night. Um, specifically, cluster headaches usually occur during REM sleep. Um, so when you are, have that, that generally happens while you are trying to sleep. Um, then there are sleep disorders themselves um, from sleep apnea, which occurs when you then have, while you're trying to sleep, it's, you stop breathing. And there are then many ways to treat this um, with basically surgery as a very good and important one. Um, but it then any type of sleep apnea from snoring to literally stopping breathing um, 
is a way that then causes insomnia and can be seen through choking, dry mouth, headaches, and basically gasping um, in the middle of the night. Um, restless leg syndrome. Restless leg syndrome is a specific type of sleep disorder that occurs while basically you get into bed and you have an inability to not move while you're not moving. While you're not moving, it basically leads you to think of nothing else but your desire to move. And if you then don't move during your sleep um, or don't move in that moment, you're then not going to be able to handle that moment. Um, finally, circadian rhythm sleep disorders. I've gone over circadian rhythms. But jet lag, shift work changes, um, delayed sleep phase, um, which occurs primarily in adolescence while they're then basically going to bed later and later and later, um, pushed back further by homework. And delayed, I wrote the same thing twice. Uh, great. Delayed sleep phase <laughs> and uh, following uh, sleep phase syndrome. Um, that's then primarily with the elderly who then are going to bed pushing earlier and earlier and earlier. Um, so now we're going to quickly go over the questionnaire results. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you, whoever did the drum roll. Appreciate it. Gabe, Gabe, you're gonna need to pull it up on your computer. So you're gonna if you didn't get a chance to sign in yet, sign it still over there by the snacks. Okay. Yeah. Oh, fuck. No. Are you there? Well, there's still the sugar in the bottom of the bag. If you're interested. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how much you want something sour right now. <laughs> Uh, there are unfortunately all. <laughs> there are no kids remaining. <laughs> the children are gone. Oh, I was so close to I would scare them. I would just creep everyone out. Like, <laughs> like, yeah. These are these people who are like constantly trying to outdance you. Yeah. 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 And I would just bring it. Just go out with that. What do you think? I feel like that's the opposite of a cover. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? I don't know. I'm not sure. I feel like it would be. I don't know. Maybe. If I have to commit, I have to really commit. Cool. Oh, I need. Look at that pie. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So going, going through the date. So uh, as you'll see, we have our uh, first data visualization up on the board. Uh, this is an assessment of uh, your all self-reported sleep difficulty uh, on a, uh, an average night, I believe. Uh, let's see. So, Bibby, if you want to yeah, give one through. Yeah, give me one second. Yes. Great. Um, now enjoy this beautiful graph. <laughs> so just to walk you guys through just the uh, beginning part of it. Um, the blue is about difficulty falling asleep. The uh, orange is about staying asleep. And the yellow is uh, waking up too early. And the gray is for the lucky people here who seem to not have any of the above uh, difficulties uh, regarding falling asleep. So as you can tell, though, a majority of people in this room, uh, thank you again for coming to see this presentation, uh, do, do suffer from uh, one of these forms of sleep difficulties, which could potentially be an early warning sign of uh, insomnia uh, if it is uh, prevalent. Uh, multiple days in a row, or if it's a pattern, it could be the beginning of uh, that form of fit disorder. So it's good that we can see. It's actually much more common than you might think. Uh, more than a majority of the people here reported some kind of difficulty in that regard. Sorry, that was... 
this is the accurate data. Um, there were a few oh. added. Oh. Oh. Sorry, oh. there were there were a few added responses. Oh. That was not correct. So this is the accurate data. So as you can see, that 44% of the people in this room have difficulty falling asleep at night. Um, but then 13% are waking too early, 6% are staying asleep, and 37% are then don't have any of these issues as a primary concern. Um, which then basically we have 63% of the people in this room are suffering of some form of insomnia. Um, whether it be acute or chronic, I, I can't tell from this data. Um, but it's then, it is a very prevalent issue, especially among college students. Um, it's something that we don't particularly talk about. It's something that we sort of will make jokes about constantly, um, of how late we will stay up one night, or, oh, I didn't get that much sleep. But that doesn't necessarily, that doesn't make it okay. This is actually a serious problem um, where sleep is something that we all need. Um, and so just for a few more ones, none of these data is written down, that's great. Um, we had 19% um, of people have trouble falling back asleep after they've woken up in, during the night. 13% um, of people I have taken drugs to fall asleep. Um, we've had we had six people have things disturb them while they were sleeping, such as light, <coughs> loud neighbors, roommates, <laughs> noises, laptops, and homework. <laughs> um, and then an average sleep time of what time people are falling asleep at night. Um, no person in the room went to bed before 11 p.m. Um, yes. um, with most people going to bed at around midnight, but the distribution tracking way past where, based on a circadian rhythm, we should be falling asleep. We should be falling asleep around the 11 to 12, maybe 12, 30, or 1 range. But with people extending far past that, that's then where the issue issues arise. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, and then my graph wasn't made, but this is then the distribution of our wake up times. Um, with people waking up then basically between 6 and 11 a.m., um, which means that for most people, um, with most people waking up at 8 a.m. and going to bed at around midnight to 1, that is 7 to 8 hours of sleep. Um, so on, upon that, that's not too bad. Um, but I cannot tell you, because um, I do not know, who is going to bed along each of these distributions. Um, so the smallest amount of sleep possible is 2 hours on this graph. Um, but then the largest amount of sleep possible being 11 hours. Um, yeah, which is also not healthy. Um, sleeping more is not necessarily a good thing. Um, when you are sleeping too little, it basically is accumulating a certain amount of sleep debt, as it is called, um, which is then only able to be overcome by sleeping more than you are supposed to be sleeping. Um, yeah, that's, that's the great. So just to return back to the, um, the actual presentation and, you know, just to note, um, if the information that we just provided here based on your results interests you more in learning more about possibly your own, uh, propensity to have insomnia, uh, there are plenty of resources online, um, again, let us know after the presentation, we can forward you off, uh, studies that we use for a lot of information uh, in this presentation. All right, then just very quickly go through different types of treatments. So there are three main ways to treat acute insomnia. Uh, the first way is through lifestyle changes, and that does treat the underlying causes as opposed to um, just the symptoms of the insomnia, and that tends to be the one that we want to go to first. Uh, and then the other ways are prescription medications and over-the-counter over medicines. 
So for lifestyle changes, there are a lot of things you can do. You can avoid caffeine, tobacco, and other stimulants. Avoid over-the-counter prescription medicines that can disrupt sleep. We'll talk about that in just a second. Avoid alcohol, for that reason I mentioned before. Um, and adopt habits that help you to fall asleep and stay asleep. Like you want to try and set up a schedule if you can. Um, schedule your daily exercise far in advance of your sleep so that your body's not like ready to go work out when you're trying to fall asleep. Don't eat or drink a lot before going to bed. And make sure that your room is sleep friendly. So try not to have a lot of noise, try not to have a lot of light, have it be a good temperature. And again, you do want to try and go to bed and wake up at the same time every single night just because your body's really smart and it's going to try and figure out your schedule. So if it's like, I know that at, at 9 p.m. every night we go to sleep, then uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to get ready to sleep at that time. And then second, prescription medicines. There are a lot that I'm not going to try to pronounce up here on the board, um, but they do have some negative side effects associated with them. For instance, parasomnia, which is um, like sleepwalking, sleep eating, sleep driving even, so that can be a little dangerous. Um, drowsiness, headache, dizziness, it's a thing, we learned all about it today. Um, it can be habit forming, so you come to rely on this medication, which is not always a great thing. Um, and it is recommended if you do use one of these medications that you use it before you get a full night's sleep. So you can't just take this and say, all right, I only have four hours to sleep tonight, because you're going to wake up and your body still wants to be asleep for the rest of that you know, eight hour chunk, but you're under this medication and it's just going to mess everything up. Uh, you want to take it right before bed so that you don't um, like take it an hour before and then have to do any activities that might be dangerous if you are actively sort of falling asleep as you are trying to stay awake. Uh, and do not, under any circumstances, take it with alcohol. Um, Over-the-counter me medicine, again, it's not super recommended, although it is safe to use when it is used correctly. Um, it's regulated by the FDA. Oftentimes, it'll, it'll be like antihistamine used to treat insomnia. Again, not for long-term use. So if you're using it every single day for over two weeks, it stops being effective because your body just kind of gets used to it. So it's only for short instances, single instances. Don't want to use it for long term. Um, melatonin, herbal therapies, um, and oftentimes people will treat insomnia using antidepressants. Just so you know, those are not regulated by the FDA or approved by the FDA specifically to treat insomnia. It just sort of happens to be a like side effect that it does have an impact on your insomnia. Cool. So uh, when it comes to chronic insomnia, a lot of the treatments that uh, Eve was just going over uh, would also have an impact. But um, when it comes to the long-term uh, behavioral triggers, which are associated with chronic insomnia, it's very important to get specific treatments tailored towards the more uh, longer incident of the uh, disorder. So uh, the two main types of uh, therapy that are out there, uh, usually you start the regimen with the behavioral therapy, because as Eve was uh, just talking about, a lot of the medications that are used for treatment of insomnia do not remove the underlying obstacles or the anxiety-inducing stimuli that can cause a reoccurrence of the insomniac condition. So it would only be at best a method to cope with the symptoms. Uh, it was recognized in the field that combining the two forms, behavioral and pharmaceutical, could have a larger magnitude of effect than either of the two. But if you only had to do one, uh, behavioral is definitely the more important one. So when it comes to the two main ones I outlined here, stimulus control and paradoxical intention, stimulus control is essentially where you try and reconfigure your body's uh, responses to a sleep stimuli, for example, in your bed. So the idea is to stop yourself from using your bed for any other purpose except falling asleep. So if you know anybody, uh, you know, we, we live in dorm rooms, we got limited space, you know anybody who actually they study on their beds, they watch movies or Netflix on their bed, what have you, they do other activities besides sleeping on their bed, that has been shown to actually be a potential uh, inducer for insomniac conditions. And it's uh, very important that uh, you know during this form of therapy that you really cut down on the uh, other forms of use for that space, uh, trying to take your activities uh, elsewhere if possible. Um, and uh, for paradoxical intention, <laughs> for paradoxical intention, um, this one I thought was very fascinating. It was actually a very interesting one because uh, 
instead of, you know how I mentioned earlier that a lot of people when they get anxiety about sleeping, it's because they're thinking to themselves, oh my God, I, I need to get to sleep right now. I'll, I'll calculate it out. If I fall asleep right now, I'll get like seven and a half hours. I've done this before. I bet other people in this room have done that before. So the idea of paradoxical intention therapy is that you mentally reapprise the situation and instead of saying, I gotta get to sleep right now, you instead say, I'm gonna see how long I can stay up. I'm gonna try and stay awake and I'm gonna really focus on that. I'm gonna try and resist these pressures. That's why it's called paradoxical intention because you'd think it's counterintuitive, right? That you would want to stay awake and it, wouldn't that make you stay awake? They've actually shown in research studies that it will reduce the performance anxiety that you might feel cognitively to fall asleep because you're essentially distracting yourself and you're reframing the cognitive task that needs to occur before you sleep. So it, this one doesn't have as large a magnitude of effect as the stimulus control therapy, but it still has a large enough magnitude that it is administered uh, a lot when it comes to the forms of therapy used. Uh, it seems to work a lot for uh, elderly individuals as well. And then uh, there are also pharmaceutical interventions here. The primary class of drug that's prescribed are known as hypnotics, uh, such as uh, benzodiazepine. Uh, that's the primary drug that would be prescribed. Uh, it's essentially, it's an agonist uh, for certain uh, neurotransmitters in the brain, and it can help induce a sleep state. And then there are tricyclic antidepressants, which as Eve alluded to, it's basically a, a side effect of uh, other impacts of antidepressants. Um, and then there are non-prescription drugs, you know, like antihistamines and melatonin. But as I said before, the best thing you can do is a behavioral therapy, possibly coupled with a pharmaceutical intervention but you need to eliminate the underlying causes. And again, those underlying causes might be another illness. Yeah, so when you're trying to treat comorbid insomnia, um, the first and foremost thing that you have to do is you have to treat the comorbidity. Um, because what can end up happening is that if you fail to treat the comorbidity, then the insomnia will likely remain afterwards. Because it then could be a cause of it. You can also then have the comorbidity itself exacerbated by whatever treatment you are using on the insomnia. So only once you have treated the comorbidity can you then go about treating the insomnia with the lifestyle changes, the cognitive behavioral therapy, or the pharmacological agents as discussed by Eve and Gabe. Um, what can then end up happening is that despite treating the comorbidity, um, it doesn't then necessarily guarantee that the insomnia is going to go away. Um, for example, 44% of patients who have had depression as well as coupled with insomnia, once they have treated the depression and have used effective management on it, you then still can have insomnia, still have insomnia afterward. Um, and so these causes for continuation um, is basically an incomplete resolution of the comorbidity. That's a very large one. Um, so if you do not actually treat the other issue, you then have the insomnia come back if it is a cause of it. Um, treatment of comorbidities themselves can actually cause insomnia, as discussed with the medication as a form of comorbidity. Insomnia can be caused by another unidentified disorder. So you can actually have multiple disorders at the same time while still having insomnia. Comorbid insomnia is just specified as having one other one, but you can still have many. Um, and then the other one is that you can have a coexistence of the primary insomnia disorder with the comorbidity, and that they're both independent of each other. And so even though you're treating one, it is actually no treatment of the insomnia itself. Um, so here are our sources. <laughs> Here's some of the sources. And thank, thank you so you. much for coming, Travis. <laughs>